For over a thousand years, the global church has spent the weeks leading up to Easter in reflection, prayer, and fasting. In the year 325, Christian leaders of the church got together in Nicaea, modern day Turkey, and they talked about best and common practices. What they came up with was a 40 day fast, what we call Lent, modeled after Jesus' own 40 days of fasting in the wilderness. Lent has taken many forms since, but the principle resides. Pause, abstain, and abide in the spiritual presence of a holy God. How might God speak to you if you took the time to listen? How might he lead if you took the time to ask? This spring, we invite you to Lent. Spend time listening to God and abiding in Christ. It might be giving up food for a period or abstaining from social media or news or TV. Maybe you need to go without chocolate or coffee or wine. Whatever it is that might be a distraction or even an idol, anything that's keeping you from abiding with God. Join us this spring as we intentionally listen and prepare to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. 40 Days of Lent begins on Wednesday, February 22nd. There are reading plans, fasting guides, devotions, and more available on abcchurch.org forward slash Lent. Hi, ABC family. I'm so glad you've joined us for our online service. I'm Carrie, and I have a few things to let you know about before we hear from Jake this morning. The first one is our date night. We are providing a date night for marriage couples tonight at the church from 5.30 to 7.30. We will be providing your kids pizza, and we would love for you to take advantage of this free childcare so you and your spouse can get away for a date night. Sign up online and all the other information can be found on our website. And next Sunday night on February 26th from 5.30 to 7.30, we are having a marriage night. We'll be having a teaching and conversation about marriage. Bring your kids, we'll be feeding you, and we'll have child care for them. Mighty Oaks is a Christian organization that provides a week-long program for veterans and first responders who have experienced trauma. Their next graduation is here at the church on March 10th. 5.30, there will be a potluck, and at 6.30, we'll have a graduation ceremony. So come support our veterans and celebrate with them their success through this program. Finally, I wanted to make sure you all knew that the next Tuesday Women's Bible Study is starting on February 21st. So come join us as we go through the Book of Numbers during this Lenten season. We have our studies at 9 a.m. and 6.45 p.m. on Tuesday. Now we'll hear from Jake. Hey, thanks for watching. I'm so glad that we're focusing so much on Lent over the next uh, few weeks. I really encourage you to do that. It makes me think of in Galatians when Paul is talking about how in our lives we're constantly navigating this battle between the flesh and the spirit. And if you think about the idea of working out, like you're you're training your muscles, in some way you're, you're inflicting pain uh, on your muscles so that then when game time comes or competition comes or whatever it is in front of you, you're stronger. Like that part of you, that muscle is exercised and it's stronger. When you think about life, you are going to be hit with so many temptations, so many times where you're called to say yes to the spirit and no to the flesh. And ultimately, that's what fasting, that's what abstinence is. It's this opportunity where you're working out that muscle of saying yes to the spirit. So that as you, you know, you pick a thing, maybe you're saying no to social media, maybe you're saying no to, to some kind of food or sugar or alcohol or something, you're really working out this muscle that then when the real hard temptation comes in your life, um, you're just a bit more fit spiritually, a bit more ready to say yes to the spirit and no to the flesh. So Lent, do it with us, engage. Uh, it's gonna be a great time as we lead up to this epic celebration of Easter here in a little bit at ABC. Now we're getting into um, week two of our three week marriage and singleness series. It's my duty today to try to say some true helpful things about the topic of singleness. Three disclaimers as we talk about this. Number one is I'm gonna be talking a little bit about sex uh, today. So I don't know who you're watching this with. There might be kids in the room or in the car as you're listening to this. I just wanna give you a heads up. I would appreciate that as a dad. Um, I, it, nothing crazy, nothing graphic, obviously, but I will say a few things that might beg some questions if you haven't had some preliminary um, conversations about that with your kids. Just wanna give you a heads up. Number two is this. Um, there's this fantastic book by Sam Albury. Sam was one of our conference speakers last year for our culture conference. 
He wrote a book called Seven Myths About Singleness. Um, I just want to give a blanket credit and direct you to his book. Um, most of my talk right now, if it's not directly quoted from him, just know that it was almost directly informed um, by my reading and study of that book. He has this one line that summarizes it so well. He said, if marriage shows us the shape of the gospel, singleness shows us its sufficiency. And I hope we can get at that point a little bit today. Number three, I just need to say, elephant in the room, I'm not single, I'm married. I also need to say that many of you may be single, many of you may be married. Your experience of singleness or marriage or some hybrid of the two, it's very multifaceted. You may have never been married, you may be young, you may be old, you may have been married once or even multiple times and had marriages end. You may have become single through some circumstances that were really, really painful, through unfaithfulness or through abandonment or even through the death of a spouse. I just want to acknowledge that. There's a breadth of lived experience anytime we talk about something like this. You may love being single. You may hate being single and wish that you weren't. I just want to say this and just to say that I can't say it all. Like I can't, I can't connect every dot between the truth of scripture and, and the unique particularities of your experience and your life season. I'm just gonna try my absolute best to be faithful to what scripture says and hopefully something that is said in these moments is helpful and lands in a, in a relevant spot for you. Um, now, by way of intro, I was asking a single friend, um, like, how do I talk? How do I open this up? Uh, and she said, let's talk about some phrases that single people are tired of hearing in church. Uh, so if you're single and you have been in the church for a while, maybe you've been told something like this. Man, you're such a gem. Why aren't you married yet? And you just feel sad about yourself for a minute. <laughs> or they say, maybe you just need to focus more on God. Man, what an invitation to just focus more on God right now. I love this line. Have you tried online dating? Oh my gosh, thank you. I've never thought about online dating. Or this one. You know, Jesus really is your true companion. Jesus is the lover of your soul. How could you ask for more? You ever heard that? Or, God is just waiting to give you someone really special. Like as if everyone who's married already, like they just kind of settled with whoever they have, but you, no, 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 God's waiting. Man, the cream of the crop is coming your way, right? Or just the classic, have you tried praying about it? Have you? You tried praying about it? I, I, if you're single, you have probably heard that. Um, sometimes people with good intentions, they say things and they just land um, in the wrong way. I'm hoping that none of this sounds like that or feels like that uh, today. As we keep moving, let me just define what I mean by singleness. Uh, from a biblical perspective, when the Bible talks about being single, whether it was Paul or Jesus or even throughout the Old Testament, what that means is that you're unmarried and in your um, your singleness there, you are making the choice to be sexually abstinent as well. So you're unmarried and you're sexually abstinent. Now, if you are living out some kind of hybrid version of that, maybe you're unmarried but not sexually abstinent um, or, or any version of all of that, I just want to say I'm so glad you're listening. And there's zero judgment from me. I I'm hoping that something that's said today could help you take a step to becoming more like Jesus uh, today. That's what we're all here for. Now, why talk about singleness? Let's talk about some, some why, some goal here. Basically, two reasons. One is selfless and one is a selfish reason. The selfless reason is this. We're all part of the same body. We need to understand that from 1 Corinthians 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. If one member suffers, all suffer together. And if one member is honored, all rejoice together. See, if one member of this church family is living a certain felt experience of some kind, by signing up to follow Jesus, you agree to enter into that experience with them. You may not be single, but you agree, church, to share in the unique burden and the unique blessings of singleness and of the single people in our church. So a big primary reason, like why talk about this? Why is this important? A big reason is simply unity among the family of God. 
If there's an experience someone is going through, you care, you sign up to care about that and to enter into that in whatever capacity with them. Okay, that's a selfless reason, an others-focused reason. But there's also a selfish reason. You could say a self-motivated reason. Think about this. If you're not currently single, I'm just gonna say that there's a really good chance that you will be single again someday. And if my math is right, it's about a 75% chance. Let me explain. There's ultimately two ways that marriages end. So if you're married here today, there's two ways that that could end, either in divorce or in death. Divorce is anywhere from 40 to 50%. So half of marriages will then make it past that threshold. But then for the half of the population that stays married for a whole lifetime, it's just basic math, 50% of those people will end up single because their spouse will die before them. And I plan on going out notebook style, like in a hospital bed right next to uh, my wife at the same time, but it's not likely. That movie, by the way, that woman leaving a perfectly good man who's like good to her and faithful to her and providing her because she has some old fling with Ryan Gosling, just because he's Ryan Gosling and somehow she's still the protagonist of the movie. I don't understand it. Anyways, that's not what the talk is about. But if my math is right, only 25% of us will never be single again. Okay, right? That makes sense. Like 40 to 50% of marriages end in divorce, and then 50% of those married people um, will die before their spouse. So I know you're welcome. You're like, okay, divorce and death. I'm just saying the questions and the freedoms and the fears that your single friends are living with all of the time those are the same things that you will wrestle with again at some point in your life, or there's a really good chance that you will. So we do well, both for selfless reasons and even for selfish reasons, to consider some of those things. Let's go to a text in Matthew 22. Matthew chapter 22, verses 23 through 33. I'm gonna read that straight through. Um, Jesus is saying some fascinating things about marriage and eternity that'll help us frame how we talk about singleness. So the same day, Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection, and they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. I love just imagining, like they set up this scene and they just think they're gonna trick him so good. You know, they're like, but what if? <laughs> Listen to this. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died. And having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Jesus is just like going along with them. Like, okay, okay, go on. So too, the second and the third down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died. And they're like getting ready, looking at each other. Like here comes the bomb, right? After them all, the woman died. Now in the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. <laughs> You know, and they have like this evil laugh, like thinking they finally stumped Jesus. Stop right there for a second. Remember the Sadducees, they don't believe that there's a resurrection. So what they're trying to do is trap Jesus in the fact that either there's no resurrection or like marriage means nothing. So they're, they're giving him this just wild, like ridiculous question. You know, it's the, it's the philosophy 101 class in your first semester of college. And he's like, what if God made a rock too big? He can't move it. And you're like, oh my gosh, you're so smart. How'd you think of such a tricky question? So it's like that kind of thing they're trying to do to Jesus, right? Right now. Verse 29, but Jesus answered them, you're wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And that's what nobody would have expected Jesus to say. They would have been sitting there listening, thinking, okay, yeah, Jesus, what are you going to say? You're going to discredit yourself in your teaching about the resurrection because they have a really good question. I mean, that's a tricky question. And Jesus, he said, I'm, I'm not talking about that ridiculous, tricky question. I'm just gonna tell you some plain truth. There's actually no marriage in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. Jesus says, there's no marriage in heaven. That's interesting. Why wouldn't there be marriage in heaven? Because marriage exists for a purpose. 
And we need to understand that that purpose isn't something that we will always need. Does that make sense? We will not always need the purposes that marriage accomplishes. First, it's a picture of God's love for his people, right? It's a tangible flesh and bone image of the relationship between Jesus and his bride. Now think about pictures for a second. Like when I'm away from my family, here's what I do a lot of. I, I have my phone and I grab it and I look at my phone. I look at pictures of my family, like screensaver, this adorable picture of my two little girls. When I am home, uh, with them, when I'm sitting on the couch, I don't often sit there and look at photos of them when they're next to me on the couch, right? I look at them. Like, that'd be ridiculous. That'd be super silly. I look at them when I'm with them. There will come a time with marriage and with Jesus and with eternity, there's going to come a time where we don't need to carry around the picture in our pockets because we'll have the real thing that the picture was always meant to point to. We're not gonna need a bunch of grooms and brides running around. We are all the bride and he's the groom. We won't need the picture anymore. Not only is it a picture, but it's also a tool for sanctification. Jeff talked about that last week. He said that marriage exists to help you become more like Jesus. That's what we are all here for. But again, the end game for us is that that project is gonna be complete. Okay, your sanctification, boom, done. It'll be glorification time as you rule and reign with Jesus for all of eternity. I have to say all of that because if we want to think rightly about singleness, we have to think rightly about marriage. We have to acknowledge that we have the tendency to idolize our earthly temporal marriages. And when we idolize marriage, I believe that we ostracize singleness. But when we think rightly about marriage and just how temporary it is, just how finite it is, and just about its purpose and also its end, when we think rightly about that, I think we can think rightly about singleness. Now to frame the rest of the talk, I just wanna lay out five myths about singleness. Alberry's book has seven. I kinda condensed it down to five that I think will be the most helpful for us today. Five myths about singleness and then a few um, uh, closing comments after that. Myth number one is this. Singleness is either too hard or it's too easy. Singleness is too hard or too easy. There's this fascinating little scene in Matthew chapter 19, and I won't read it for us, but Jesus is, is giving a quick teaching on divorce, and he almost dissuades marriage entirely. He's just talking to a few people, and ultimately he's just saying, well, if anyone can receive singleness, they should really try to receive it. He, he really endorses singleness. So on one hand, singleness is very hard. We need to understand that. We need to know that. I'm not saying it's too easy. I'm also not saying it's too hard. But sometimes when we hold up the difficulty of singleness in a disproportionate way, what we're accidentally doing is we're understating the difficulty of marriage or the difficulty of discipleship to Jesus as married people. There's this question in there. Are we expecting a more rigorous discipleship to Jesus out of single people because they're single than we are out of married people because, oh, they're busy. You know, they, they've, you know, they've got to focus on their relationship. So let's really expect just this higher, holier calling of single people than we do of, uh, of husband and, and wife. Are we expecting more than we are from married people? But on the other hand, is singleness too easy? One uh, writer said this, singleness means solvency, great sex, and a guilt-free life. I say that because that's, that really is, I think for a lot of our world, that's the idea, like that's the, the, the overarching sentiment of what singleness is, and that's why it's so great. Hold on to it. Man, avoid the trap of marriage, the old ball and chain, just a guilt-free life. I mean, yeah, in some ways that would sound really easy, but no, that's not it. That's not what singleness is because biblically it, it does demand something of you. It, it calls for uh, sexual abstinence. It calls for using it and for being faithful with it in a kingdom-oriented way. So then the culture is kind of just saying, yeah, singleness is, 
is too hard or it's too easy. So let's stretch what marriage means and and then marriage can mean all kinds of different things that make it easier or more accessible or more relevant to everybody no matter what your preference is. Or let's stretch what singleness is. And you can kind of do anything that married people do but still be single somehow. You can you can play house and you can you can play marriage sort of but like without the the covenant you know a uh, uh, commitment of marriage. That's what happens when you either say that it's too hard or too easy, then you end up stretching marriage beyond the God-given limits of marriage, or you end up stretching the definition of singleness beyond the biblical definition of singleness. And Jesus in Matthew 19 and and elsewhere, he's just kind of saying, yeah, marriage is really hard. Yeah, singleness is really hard too. I I don't know, maybe, maybe consider singleness. See, I want, I want us to be clear, it's not a difference of hard versus easy. Ultimately, it's a difference of complexity versus simplicity, but not hard versus easy. Marriage and singleness are equally hard and equally fruitful. Let me say that again, equally hard, equally difficult, and really equally fruitful. Not identical, but equal in their value and in their fruit and what they accomplish for the kingdom of God. It's just that one has an added layer of relationship, so there's the added potential of mess and of complication. That's what marriage does. And the other does not have that complexity. You need to land with this conclusion right there of saying, okay, are you married? Praise God, use it well. Be married and use it well. Are you single? Praise God, it's a gift, use it well. That's myth number one, is that it's either too hard or it's too easy. Myth number two is this, that singleness requires a special gift. We can't talk about singleness without going to 1 Corinthians 7. Um, So go with me, 1 Corinthians 7, 25 through 35. I'm gonna skip a little bit here and jump around, but starting in 25, let me read this. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it's good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. Up to verse 32. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, but the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. Verse 35, listen to this. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. In verses 25 through 40, Paul kind of lays out the most comprehensive um, New Testament teaching on singleness and and being betrothed and being married. And if you are in any one of those seasons, what, what to do? Like how to use that, how to steward that out of faithfulness to the Lord. But I think that sometimes when we talk about it, and this is kind of how I grew up. I grew up in church and I would hear this phrase, the gift of singleness. And with that, there was like, a little bit of a shiver down my spine and an unspoken sense that that feels a little bit like a death sentence. Like, or I remember being a, a high school student and hearing that and kind of hearing someone teach through 1 Corinthians 7 and I just thought, oh God, what if I have the gift of singleness? You know, like it's it's one of maybe the spiritual gifts and it's like, if I have it, then okay, I guess I, like am I a monk or is it, do you have to be like a nun? Is that like what it means? And it feels like, the, if you're talking about it in those terms, it feels like this gift that like, you don't really grow up like wanting that gift. I would just say about 1 Corinthians 7, perhaps let's take out the sense of permanence when we talk about it, just in the same way that I'm saying, okay, marriage is, I, we don't get divorced, but marriage is till death do us part. It's not forever. It's not for eternity. In heaven, it's, it's us as the bride and Jesus as the groom. In the same way, perhaps take the permanence out of our minds when we talk about the gift of singleness. Just realize right here that Paul, typical Paul fashion, he's almost just talking about contentment and missional living like he always was. Rather than saying, well, 
Looks like I have the gift of singleness, you know, said with like this sad sort of resignation. What Paul's getting at is say, okay, I am single in this season. And because that is what God has chosen to gift me with, that is a gift. Therefore, in this season, I have the gift of singleness. Likewise, are you married? Don't wish that you were single, okay? Like that could be another talk for another day. But say, I am currently married. That's a season God has for me. Therefore, in this season of life, until death do us part, in this season, I have the gift of marriage. So that, that giftedness, I think it really is more seasonal than it is permanent. Are you single? That is from the Lord. And anything from the Lord is ultimately a gift to be received from him. The question is this, not, oh, do I have the gift of singleness? The question is, how are you stewarding your singleness in this season? Are you single? How are you stewarding it? How are you using your singleness in this season? Number three, the myth is singleness means no intimacy. If I'm single, that means no intimacy for me. Now, we can live without sex, okay? But we can't live without intimacy. That comes from the creation narrative in the book of Genesis when God finally, he creates everything. And remember the pattern. He says he creates it and then he says it's good. He creates it, then he says it's good. And the first thing he says is not good is that man should be all alone. After he creates man and he sees that he's all alone, he says, ah, that's not good. It's not good that he's alone. The next thing that happens is that he creates a woman for the man. The question, does that mean that marriage is the only solution for lack of intimacy? No, absolutely not. Marriage and sex are not the only solution for alone. In fact, it's possible to have lots of intimacy with no sex, just like it's possible to have lots of sex with no intimacy. We were made for intimacy. And and you know how I know that's true? Because even... I think in our our unhealthiest thought patterns about this, there's almost a second class citizenship you may think of for a single person. When you think of sex and intimacy and okay, well then a single person, a single Christian, ah, they must be missing out on like, on like a wholeness of the human experience. And, And how you know that that's ridiculous is because who is the most perfect, full, whole human to ever exist? It was a single man, a rabbi, a teacher from Nazareth. His name was Jesus. We worship him here. The most perfect, full, complete human to ever exist. Not married. Like, are we saying, okay, man, he was really missing something of the human experience. He was really missing, you know, a piece of wholeness because he was single. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. We were made for intimacy. And one of the most important but often overlooked themes throughout the whole Bible, just as a way of practical, you know, what do you do? Um, one of the most important themes is the role of friendship. It's the role of community, the role of family that goes beyond family. Think about friendship, though. The idea of friend is so cheapened, I think, in a post-Facebook uh, culture. But Scripture talks about the kind of friend that sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 18, 24. There's a kind of friendship given by God as a gift that literally surpasses the bond between nuclear family. And that kind of intimacy and that relationship is real and significant. C.S. Lewis has this great quote, those who cannot conceive friendship as a substantive love betray the fact that they have never had a friend. Being a person who just can't understand the the kind of intimacy that a quality God-given friendship can provide, if you just say, no, no way, no way can that give that kind of intimacy. You've just never had that kind of friend. Okay, myth number three is that singleness means no intimacy. We know that that isn't true. Myth number four, singleness means no family. Singleness means no family. And this is encouragement for singles, but it's really conviction, I hope, for families in our church. Uh, Remember with me, Mark chapter 10, Jesus completely redefines family. He says, there's no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. 
Jesus gives a promise to those who feel right now, who, who might feel removed or, or even uninvited or unwelcomed from the idea of earthly nuclear families. He gives this incredible promise. And just notice how he says it. He says they will receive a hundredfold when? Maybe you have the tendency to think, okay, yeah, man, be faithful. Like slog it out now. It'll be okay. Because someday, like in heaven for eternity, it'll be worth it. That's not what he says. He says, now in this time, they will receive a hundredfold houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, lands, persecution. And then he said, but it's also hard. Make no mistake. There's persecutions. But in the age to come, eternal life. He's saying, be faithful now and it'll be worth it now. Not even just then or someday, but but now. Look at what you're going to get. You will get brothers and sisters. There will be spiritual friendships with people who the intimacy with them goes beyond even a nuclear family. You'll be connected to spiritual moms and dads and to, to kids. Like, let me say, as, as a married father, married to my wife with two little kids, me and my wife cannot be everything that my kids need. I hope we understand that as parents, as married parents. I, I hope you believe that it takes a village. I hope you believe that it takes a community called the church, the family of God. I cannot be, my wife cannot be everything that my kids need. We need our single friends who stop by our house. Like we need this, this place, this body where they come and they, they say hi to people who are either single or in a totally different season of life. And, and together we're kind of raising them up together in ways that I, we can't do alone. So now in this kind of bizarre way, it's like our job as the family of God to make Jesus' vision a reality. It's, it's our job as, as nuclear families within the church to invite single people to be a real part of our real lives, to give space in our families, in our homes, to give you a voice in how we raise our kids, like to let you help us with that in ways that we don't see or we don't get, to give you literally a house key. Maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe you, a family, a married family with kids, maybe, maybe someone needs literally a key to your house, a single friend that you know and you love and you trust. See, so the world might look and say like, oh, that's sad, they're single. They must be lonely. You can say, no, sure, I'm not married, but I have brothers and sisters and spiritual moms and dads and sons and daughters and literally houses and homes because I'm part of the family of God. Myth number four is you have no family. Myth number five, as we ramp towards a close, singleness wastes your sexuality. Singleness wastes your sexuality, that's a myth. Um, But the question would go like this, if marriage is this beautiful picture of Christ and the church, but I'm single, then what's my sexuality for? Is it more than romantic love that leads to one flesh union and reproduction? Like that's kind of the, the biblical, right, idea of, of what sex is for. It, could it be for more than that? I just want to say yes. Your sexuality in and of itself, it reflects the image of God and your inbuilt desire for him. See, by being a woman, just that alone, by being a woman, you reflect the nature of God in ways that a man does not, in a way that a man cannot. By being a man, you reflect the image of God in a way that a woman cannot. The desire itself, beyond gender, the desire itself, the longing for sexual intimacy, the longing for that kind of fulfillment, that's still an intentional part of your design. And that's meant to point you to something greater, to remind us that Our souls were made for eternal companionship and intimacy with Jesus. And every prelude to that, every foretaste, it's just a taste and it's not the whole. It's not the real ultimate eternal thing, eternal love and intimacy and fulfillment that you were made for. It's just a taste. You can learn that and you can feel that whether you are a sexually active married person or you're choosing to live as a sexually abstinent single person. Sam Albury, in his book, he, he writes this quote from a guy named Clint Harrison, and then he responds to it. The quote from Harrison says this, Whether we are married or single in this life, sexual desire is our inbuilt honing instinct for the divine, a kind of navigation aid showing us the way home. And then Albury responds to that, and I love what he says. He says, 
This is great news because it means that my sexual feelings don't need to be met in order for their purpose to be fulfilled. I love that. I love the resolve, like, like the kingdom perspective, eternal perspective resolve in that. Now, let me conclude with just a couple things. Um, really, really three things here. Uh, the first is this. I want to offer just an apology um, from a pastor, from someone who whose job is to to talk and to say hopefully helpful words from scripture, um, largely on behalf of our church or for our church. I just want to offer an apology. Um, and this is for you if you are a single person um, and if you've ever experienced ostracization or hurt or loneliness um, at the hand of a church. I want to say that I'm sorry for the times that we have held up marriage as the ultimate goal. It is not the ultimate goal. We have a tendency to unintentionalize, unintentionally idolize marriage. And when we do that, we really do ostracize singleness. And I'm sorry that we do that. I'm sorry for ever making you feel unseen or, um, or uh, invalidated because of all of our stories and illustrations and application points are so often focused on marriage and kids. I know that you understand that, but at the same time, I'm sure it can get really old sometimes. I'm sorry that the overall programming of our church is so lopsided to nuclear families. I want you to know that while we try to be faithful to a demographic of families that, that are largely married, we know that we're not nailing it in ministry to single people. I just, I want you to know that we know that. We need your grace and we need your voice and your leadership to help us in that. I want you to hear that, that genuine genuine apology from us to you. Um, number two is this though, a charge for married people, a charge for, for people with who kind of got the thing with the fence and the dog and the two and a half kids, right? Charge for married people. Um, you need to know that the New Testament doesn't know anything about our American idea of the self-sufficient nuclear family, okay? The thing we do in America where we just build the fences higher and, and pull into the garage and close the door and go in the backyard, nobody ever sees us or knows us. The New Testament doesn't know anything about that. I just want to say, open your house, open your home, open your family. Married parents, okay, I, I'm a married parent. Uh, don't let marriage and parenthood become the whole of your identity. It's so easy to slip into that. Like, I, I know what that feels like to slip into that. Don't let it become the whole of your identity. Maybe you just need to hear practically that, that your single friend can go to the park with you and your kids too, right? Your single friend can come over uh, and have dinner and they, they would love that. You don't have to worry about that. You need single friends and your single friends need married friends. Ask yourself this question, married people. Can you and your spouse and your kids can you become a family of belonging for your single friends? Can your home become a second home for them? Can your life be a life that they enter into? And last, charge for single people. My biggest worry ultimately is that um, not that we make things too difficult for you or ask too much of you. Honestly, my, my biggest worry is that because we focus so much on marriage and family so often, as a church, my worry is that we let you off too easy by never calling you to the same heights of discipleship and obedience. So I, I wanna say really clearly, your singleness in this season is a gift from your father. And I understand all, all the ways that that might land with you right now. And it might be hard to, to want that or to love that. You might hate that, you might love it, I don't know. But I know that that's a season you have and God doesn't make mistakes, and it's a gift from him. Would you receive that? I wanna say, use every ounce of flexibility and freedom and time, not for selfish gain, but for kingdom work that other people can't do. Fight against selfishness and complacency. Run from sexual temptation. Battle victim mentality with intentionality. And no matter where or why or how you are in the season that you're in because it's so multifaceted. I said that at the beginning. 
you might have never been married and you might really want to be. That might have been a short time or a long time. There's so many people who maybe you are single at this point in your life because things just didn't go how you dreamed they would. Maybe something terrible happened to you. Maybe it was abandonment. Maybe it was unfaithfulness. Maybe it was death. Either way, there, there's this whole grieving process you've had to go into as you've entered into to your unique season of singleness. No matter where you are in that, I just want to challenge you. In, in the moments where you might feel alone, you might feel unseen, uninvited, or unwelcome, in, in different ways, would you let that draw you to deeper dependence on the Lord and greater intimacy with Him? Let it remind you that whether you're married or whether you're single, your soul, my soul, was never ultimately made for marriage. That is not the end goal of my eternal soul. My soul was made to know Jesus. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much that our end goal is intimacy and eternity with you. Uh, you have made us for yourself and our souls are truly restless until they rest in you. And I thank you, God. I thank you for the gift that marriage is, but ultimately I pray that we would see it as it is and, and not as anything more or not as anything that it, it wasn't designed to be. I pray that we'd see it as a picture of your divine love for your people and one that isn't gonna last for eternity. It's gonna last until we're with you for eternity. And then that's the marriage. And we're all the bride, and you are the bridegroom. Thank you for that. God, thank you for singleness. Thank you for the unique blessing that singleness is for the body of Christ. God, we also acknowledge the unique burden and the uniquely heavy load that that can be to carry. I pray, God, a special blessing over the single people in our church those who, who fight different struggles than the married people, those who ask different questions than we ask, those who are wrestling with different things than, than we wrestle with. God, would you give them all the grace, all the favor, just an abundance of your, um, your direction and strength for them. Give them what they need to live uniquely faithful lives in their season of singleness. Would we receive, God, whether we are married, whether we are single, would we receive the season you have for us as an intentional gift? And would we be intentional to use it well? God, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.